Genre versus topic. A computer-assisted approach to categorizing the royal inscriptions of Mesopotamia. Royal inscriptions are one of the most ubiquitous cuneiform sources and are found throughout Mesopotamian history. They are represented in all historical periods from the early dynastic through to the Seleucid era. Royal inscriptions are traditionally assigned to single subgenre categories such as building inscription by modern scholars. This both flattens the diverse subject matter and prioritizes one inscriptional theme above others in a manner that may not have been intended by the cultures that produced them. This paper attempts to gauge the validity of the subgenres of modern scholarship using topic modeling to investigate to what extent royal inscriptions fit into discrete subgenres. This paper will first define some key terms, then provide an overview of the corpus used and a brief description of topic modeling. An account of the methodology will follow before an analysis of selected topics. The validity of modern subgenres will be tested using a small sample of 20 inscriptions and, finally, are the conclusions of the paper. Before diving in, it's worth taking a minute to define some terms. A document can be a complete text, the chapter of a book, or even a single post from a social media platform. In this paper, a document is simply a single exemplar of a royal inscription, meaning that several documents can contain the same text. A corpus is the complete collection of documents used in a study. Genre is understood as a category of compositions that share similarities in either style, form or content. A topic model is a statistical model that is used to identify latent patterns that exist in a written corpus, and a topic model produces topics, lists of words. The topics are differentiated and expressed by these lists, their keywords, which are the most frequently occurring terms within a topic. Finally, topic coherence is a measure of how easily understood a topic is by a human researcher. The selection of inscriptions used in this study is restricted to the inscriptions from the early dynastic through to the all three periods, roughly 2700 to 2004 BCE, as digitizing this material is very time consuming. As topic modeling works best with large amounts of data, it's my intention to return to this study at a later date and incorporate all known royal inscriptions. Unfortunately, it was necessary to use English translations instead of the original language because the topic modeling package used to analyze the data has some built-in functions that could only be taken advantage of with an English language corpus. All translations used were taken from a single publication series, the Royal Inscriptions of Mesopotamia. While necessary, this is hugely problematic for the study of ancient texts, and for this reason, the analysis presented here is for heuristic purposes only, used to identify areas that may be of interest for further study, specifically, further study using the inscriptions in their original languages. The royal inscriptions are inscribed on a wide variety of objects, including building materials, vessels, and figurative sculpture. While this paper will not consider the physical objects that these inscriptions are placed upon, it is nonetheless a very important facet in the study of royal inscriptions, and again, one that I intend to return to at a later date. The royal inscription genre is defined in the royal inscriptions of Mesopotamia volumes as inscriptions that record the accomplishments of Mesopotamian kings. Other Assyriological publications nuance this broad definition. The term can cover anything from an inscription containing simply a king's name or titulary to an extensive record of significant events that occurred in that king's reign. They were composed during the reign of a king and were commissioned either by that king or on his behalf by family or occasionally a third party. The royal inscriptions are often grouped into subgenres such as votive inscription or building inscription based on criteria including the vocabulary of the inscription, the object it was inscribed upon and the location in which that object was used. As this paper focuses only on the text rather than the object, only definitions pertaining to the inscriptions themselves will be considered. The standard encyclopedia for the fields identifies several subgenres including standard inscriptions, only the king's name, 
building inscriptions that are categorized by both a specific verbal form and the naming of a building, and dedicatory inscriptions that are again identified through a verbal form. These defining characteristics are generally followed by other publications. However, a question that arises in the study of inscriptions is whether the classifications imposed on them by modern scholars accurately reflect how they were thought about by the cultures that produced them. While subgenre distinctions are useful tools for scholarship, the modern prioritization of certain vocabulary may not reflect the emic understanding of the inscriptions. For example, an inscription from the reign of Sargon should be placed in the dedicatory inscription subgenre. However, the inscription also contains a lengthy royal titulary that includes references to a military expedition as well as a substantial curse formula. Another inscription from the reign of Amar Sin fits into two subgenres, both building inscription and dedication inscription, based on the definitions discussed previously. Both of these inscriptions, that of Amar Sin and Sargon, also contain several features that are not made apparent in their subgenre placement, including royal titularies, military activities, royal deification, and curse formula. Simply categorizing these inscriptions in a single subgenre and moving on with life ignores most of the vocabulary present within them, glossing over some significant features. Even in the case of inscriptions that can be argued to easily fit into a single subgenre with minimal flattening of vocabulary, such as this inscription from the reign of Ernamu, the picture can still be more complex than in suggested with the use of a single subgenre. While undoubtedly a building inscription based on the criteria discussed, this inscription commemorates the construction of multiple buildings, both the Nana Temple and the City Wall of Awe. Topic modelling is the use of computer algorithms to discover underlying thematic structures in a collection of documents. The semi-automated nature of the process can help to mitigate against modern assumptions about textual classification, and thus may offer a productive approach to an emic understanding of the textual evidence. The practice is not completely devoid of human bias, however, as the topics themselves require interpretation and explanation by a human researcher. Topic modelling assumes that a corpus is made up of a mixture of different underlying topics that are themselves understood as a collection of words. While topics cannot be directly observed, topic modelling takes the documents in a corpus and then works backwards to infer their underlying topics. The number of topics must first be specified by the user, who then refines this based on the results produced and is tasked with interpreting the topics identified by the algorithm. The topics are expressed by a number of key words that are ordered based on their probability of appearing in passages that contain that topic. Only keywords with the highest probabilities are counted as representative for that topic, typically the first 10 to 20 words. The interpretation of that list, as I've said, is then up to the researcher. For example, a 2017 study of French classical and enlightenment drama produced a total of 60 topics. Topic 39 contained the keywords sang, mort, and meng, and was interpreted as being related to violent crimes that featured largely in the tragedies included in the study. Several topics also featured the words amour, aimer, and cure in the top two key words. Initially, this may suggest a significant overlap in topics. However, when other topics were also considered, it became apparent that these topics refer to very different kinds of love. Topic six portrays a jealous love linked to intensely negative emotions, while topic 24 refers to a love associated with a physically attractive appearance as well as inner beauty. It was later evident in the study that these love topics occur in different subgenres of the corpus. Some challenges exist with applying topic modeling to royal inscriptions. First and foremost, topic models perform best when there are large amounts of data. Even in its entirety, the corpus of royal inscriptions is, by data mining standards, relatively small. This problem is further compounded by the fact that they are not exactly lengthy. The vocabulary contained within the inscriptions is also fairly limited, with certain words appearing with high frequency within the same inscription and across the whole corpus. One excellent example of this is the word king, which is found in multiple contexts, often in the same inscription. In order to assess to what extent topics generated by topic modeling fit the modern subgenre categories of royal inscriptions, I constructed a working topic model. 
This code produces both a list of keywords for each topic and a visualization of the results. This model also includes a coherence calculator that helps to determine how many topics should be requested from the model. The topic coherence was calculated for 1 through 40 topics expressed in this graph and the associated coherence scores. As indicated, the highest coherency value was given by 26 topics. There is not enough time during this paper to analyse all 26, so analysis will be restricted to the clearest topics only. Before looking at individual topics, a word on the topic visualisation. This helps to assess the significance of each keyword in a topic. The red bar indicates the estimated number of times a given topic generates a particular word, while the accompanying blue bar indicates the frequency of each word in the entire corpus. For example, if we look at the keyword 1 on the slide, the red and blue bars indicate that this topic generates less than half of all occurrences of the word in the entire corpus. In contrast, the same topic also contains almost all occurrences of the word governor in the whole corpus. This topic model produced three topics that are easily interpreted based on their keywords, topics 1, 4 and 5. The most relevant terms in Topic 1 are King, Mighty, Man, Lord and Quarter, making it a topic that represents the appearance of royal titularies in the inscriptions. However, Topic 1 also contains almost all instances of the words dedicated, dedicate, account, booty and fashion, words that are all strongly linked to the formation and dedication of objects to the gods. While the words associated with royal titularies make up the vast majority of the topic, the presence of the formation and dedication vocabulary is also relevant and suggests a strong link between the two themes. The top two terms in topic four are build and temple, words concerned with the construction of temples by Mesopotamian kings. This topic also contains proper nouns that seem to link the building of temples with the kings of the early dynastic period. With keywords such as governor, remove, general and victorious, Topic 5 is concerned with military activity. Note also the presence of royal names from the Sargonic period, which may suggest that the topic was popular during this time. While this is a fairly rudimentary analysis of only three topics, I hope it provides a good illustration of what a topic model produces to anyone unfamiliar with this method of analysis. The practical applications of a topic model for the study of ancient texts does not end there, however. By investigating the top topics that make up individual texts, we can get a greater understanding of how these inscriptions can be understood. And by collating this data in different configurations, for example by time period or geographical region, we can begin to identify large-scale trends and patterns in inscriptional practices. In order to test the validity of modern subgenre categorizations, I took two small samples of ten inscriptions from the early dynastic period that either met the requirements for being designated a building inscription or a dedication inscription. They contain either the verb do three to build or the verb aru to dedicate, both Sumerian verbs. This table displays the distribution of topics within each inscription. Generally speaking, the distributions do appear to be split between the two subgenres, with topic one, titularies, being the only topic that has a notable presence in both. Topic 14 is entirely restricted to building inscriptions, while topics 2 and 13 are found only in dedication inscriptions. Topics 4, 7 and 8 show a preference for one subgenre over the other, but are found in inscriptions in both categories. For example, topic 4 is largely found in building inscriptions, but also appears in two dedication inscriptions possibly suggesting that the dedication inscriptions that contain this vocabulary could be assigned to the building subgenre as a secondary classification. Some support is found for this hypothesis when we consider one of these two inscriptions, an inscription of Aanupada, which was found on an alabaster bowl fragment. The text of the inscription contains the verbal markers for both building and dedication inscriptions, do three and aru, corresponding to the English words built and dedicated in the translation shown. In this instance, the topic model highlights what we should already be conscious of, that some inscriptions cannot be confined to a single subgenre, instead appearing to straddle two or more classifications. 
While this is only a small sample of the corpus, some interesting observations can still be made in regards to the topic distribution across subgenres of royal inscriptions. First, it appears that certain topics prefer one subgenre over the other, suggesting that the system of subgenres used by modern scholars to examine royal inscriptions has some emic validity. However, only a quarter of this sample has no overlap at all in topic distribution. Five of the dedication inscriptions do not contain any topics that also appear in building inscriptions. To put it another way, 75% of this sample shares, to a greater or lesser extent, the same topics. 15 of these inscriptions share a topic with at least one inscription from the other subgenre. While subgenres may have some emic validity, the topic distributions suggest that considering them as a continuum rather than a binary categorization system may be a more sensible approach. Topic modeling contains a lot of potential as a heuristic device that can both challenge our assumptions and provide a way to quantitatively test our conclusions. The consideration of topic distribution across subgenres shows that current classifications of royal inscriptions do appear to have some emic validity, though the presence of topics that span subgenres suggests that the ancient understanding of royal inscriptions may have been more complex than this, as a spectrum or continuum rather than a binary system. There is clearly more work to be done, but hopefully even this preliminary study and the patterns observed show the potential use of topic modelling for Assyriology.